Hello, everyone. Welcome back to Libraries in Response, Session 107, The Spatial Web, A New Dimension of the Internet, A Technological Awakening for AI. This is, this is a grand title for a session uh, and a, a lot for Denise to live up to, but she says she's up for it, so that's great. We also have uh, the privilege of <coughs> having uh, Jen Nelson and Alta Porterfield from the New Jersey and the Delaware Libraries. They had participated in a uh, a, a session on public AI last week at the Library of Congress, and they're going to report out on that. Very exciting developments, and uh, it sounded like uh, a, a kind of a welcome from a, a lot of very technical people for for the librarians, which we love to hear about. So we are the Gigabit Libraries Network. My name is Don Means, and uh, GLN is an open consortium of libraries doing interesting, we think, things with technology uh, and various kinds of innovation. Our host and uh, uh, and, and co-producer of the series is the International Federation of Library Associations and Institutions, IFLA, uh, based in The Hague. Uh, our partner, Stephen Weiber, is the head of public policy at IFLA. He's on a boat in Sweden somewhere right now and trying to juggle his, his support of our session today. Uh, but I think we're going to make it all right. Uh, our main sponsor this year is IMLS, the U.S. Federal uh, Library Agency. We're so grateful to them and to our other sponsors like the Internet Society uh, and the State Libraries of Michigan, New Jersey, and Texas, which are just great, fabulous. Thank you, thank you, thank you. And uh, media sponsorship from the Library Journal and Broadband Breakfast, which is a, a, an emerging and leading um gathering point for a whole range of uh, technology policy questions. Uh, this is our libraries in response. This is our, could almost be a logo. I, I, I might ask uh, this cartoonist if he wouldn't allow us to use it that way, because this just captures the situation that we're in. We started out, of course, in response to the pandemic in March of 2020, and it just kept rolling after that. There's the economic crisis and the social crisis and the, and the political crisis and, and uh, of course, the, the, the climate crisis. And now, of course, war has entered the picture. So it's a tough time for the poor old world, longing for the good old days of merely worrying about nuclear annihilation. So our view is that this poor world is supported by a, a network uh, a, a chain of 400,000 public libraries kind of wrapped around it, strengthening its its poor limbs against this uh, barrage of challenges. Uh, but that's the crux of it. You know, how are libraries responding to these crises, uh, which we've adopted this term polycrisis, that it's not just a series of crises, but these are actually interrelated and reinforcing each other, making it all even more intense, which is not good news. Um the pandemic, I was going to make the point that, uh, you know, we're not, it's not through with us. Well, it's not. <laughs> Yours truly uh, tested positive last night. And so you'll forgive me if I'm a little hoarse this morning. It's not too bad. Hopefully it stays that way. But uh, it's, it's evolving. This thing is just not finished as much as we'd like it to be. And uh, the libraries have been fantastic in dealing with all the challenges related to that. The climate has just gone nuts. Um uh, these are pictures, I guess, a couple of years old. It just kind of an array of disasters uh, hitting different parts of the world, uh, just wiping out infrastructure and homes and, you know, really an assault on civilization. I mean, it's our own, it's our own assault on ourselves, but nevertheless, this is the way it's been experienced. <laughs> There's not a lot that individual libraries can do to mitigate this. I mean, we all can do our part, right? We can recycle and and uh, use panels and every, everything we each should be doing. But what we can do at the individual level is adapt because it's, there's no stopping it. It's, it's happening. It's going to get worse. Even if we stop today, it would continue to get worse. So communities need adaptation strategies. And this is a point uh, where libraries can step in and lead that conversation and demonstrate certain uh, techniques and technologies that can increase resilience for communities. And we encourage that, of course. Uh, AI is the latest crisis. 
uh, and our part of our topic today. Uh, it maybe doesn't quite look like COVID or climate change, but it is in a way it's global and it's disrupting things. How much we don't know. Uh, nobody really seems to know. I mean, everybody, a lot of people have ideas and they claim they know, but it just doesn't seem like anybody really knows, but we're going as humanity does just pell-mell into the future and we'll find out what happens. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's us. Mm -hmm. uh, AI has been our most popular topic. Uh, this is a list of uh, about 15 sessions we've had around AI. These are all found on the Libraries and Response YouTube channel, as this session will be hopefully by tomorrow, and you'll be able to see it. We've had, uh, since we started, we've had well over 10,000 registrations for the series, and we've had uh, over 12,000 uh, YouTube views, post-session recording views, which is really gratifying because you know i don't know about you but I, I tend to not go back but uh it's it's great that people do they miss it or they want to look at it again whatever reason it's just it's a, it's an archive that we're by the way trying to figure out how to protect against uh bit rot that is to say the idea that the, all this all these digital content has to be maintained by other digital technology and uh, as Vince Cerf has been pointing out for a long time, all these things are various additions of hardware and software that over time they change and they expire. And the companies that are maintaining these databases, like uh, 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 which one was it? The, the pre-Facebook uh, social network, they just dumped everything. And uh, there's just, it's just a lot of history that's just being spilled out on the on the concrete, gone forever. We don't think of it like that because we think of, well, okay, it exists, so it'll exist. Because we, we print a book, it'll be there for 100 years. But no, this is not that. That's a problem. This is digital. So uh, our topic, uh, our main topic is this IEEE approval of the spatial web protocol, which is really fascinating to the extent that I understand it. Uh, but that's why I'm here for, and hopefully you all are joined for the same reason, to figure out what this different approach is that uh, somehow distributes uh, key parts of the World Wide Web so that it's, well, I suppose, more resilient and, and, and more interactive and more comprehensive, apparently, since it's the idea here is that it connects to everything, both digital and physical. So this is going to be super interesting. Um here is, I've, I've stolen this from Denise, and it's a journey of uh, AI uh, classic, which has been around for a long time. AI has been out there manipulating us and massaging databases and doing uh, financial trading for years. What's changed is, is now there's a, there's a version of it. It's in the hands of end users, and that's, that's different. And it's awakened everybody to what? Uh, challenges and threats and dreams and so uh we'll we'll get into that first uh we're going to get a little debrief from uh jen and uh alta who were uh invited to an invitation only kind of high level event at the library of congress last week on public ai uh many of you have uh, been with us we've had this discussion a couple of times it's a fascinating concept that uh we just talk about AI like, you know, it's our thing as, as a collective, you know, society, but it's not, it's the property of a few of actually a very few enormous corporations, which have their own motivations. And, um, so that doesn't seem like the best approach to rely on the tender mercies of Facebook and Google to protect us from, AI or to act in our, our in our best interest, they will do what corporations do. They will optimize their profit. That's this is what how they're built. That's their DNA. So we can't expect them to do other than that. Maybe we can put some pressure on them. We can threaten them with breaking them up. You know, we get them to, to do certain things. But this is an alternative. This is like a public option AI, which is an appealing thing, but it cannot be simple to do. So uh, this is from publicai.net. Uh, 
built on reliable public infrastructure, like so many things are that we rely on. And uh, this is how we have really progressed as a civilization. We've built these common uh, platforms for services that have had tremendous impact on economic development and social development and everything else. Uh, and so to apply that same concept to AI is kind of what this is about. So I'll, I'll put that link in the chat. Uh, it's a presentation. I highly recommend it. And um, we will be back to this topic, but we're going to touch on a little bit on how it went last week. And uh, we're going to do that right now, asking Jen Nelson, the New Jersey State Librarian, to lead off. Jen, you were there. And um, how was it? Well, you know, Don, I would be honest and admit I felt a little bit like the kid at the grown-ups table at Thanksgiving dinner. Um, <laughs> the caliber of uh, attendees was um, super high power, uh, and it was... Um, really in, enlightening in many ways. Um, Lawrence Lessig from Harvard did give the keynote address, um, which was interesting. He coined a new acronym, what he calls CRISC, which is critical risk or catastrophic risk. And, you know, discuss that as, you know, sort of a primary concern with AI is, you know, what are the risks catastrophic and what do they look like? Um, he did also note the need for um, some sort of regulation, regulatory framework, some kind of governance. Um, people were pretty clear that that's missing. Um, I did put a link in the chat already to the white paper that um, sort of founded the conversation um, for us. There were people from act academia, uh, several people from libraries actually, which was kind of cool. Um, and uh, 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 industry, of course, I had a great conversation with the guy from the Argonne, Argonne National Labs that's actually doing the computer speed behind AI. So just very technical, but very interesting. Um, for those who aren't familiar with the notion of public AI, it's really uh, about three things, um, access, accountability, and permanent pub permanently public. Um, and, uh, you know, I think uh, one of the questions they had us think a lot about was what would it look like if AI uh, worked for us as individuals and as industries and as um, people. So we had some really interesting conversations. Um, I think my big takeaway um, from it was um, probably the notion of that we're in a state of, of indus the industry of ideas. Um, and I can't really articulate it very well in my head. It, it has to do with how far we're advancing and how quickly um, around ideas and the idea that something can happen and make happen. Um, the uh, other piece that I took away, uh, there was a woman there from Northeastern University who runs the GovLab there, um, talked about the digital public infrastructure and really looking at a participatory approach to that. Um, so what does it look like when the people who are users uh, are the people who are creating it? Um, and then the final thing that I'll mention is there um, was a lot of conversation about an organization called Innovate US, and I'll put their URL in the uh, in the chat as well. And that um, organization offers free workshops and courses. Um, their larger area is innovation, but they've got a whole series of things on um, on, uh, on AI for the public sector. And as somebody who works in the public sector, I found that to be uh, super valuable and actually did um, take one of their courses already, self-directed courses, and really gave me a much firmer grounding in AI than I'd had in terms of what is it? How does it work? Uh, I had a fascinating article from the New York Times that um, that graphically went through what happens when an uh, when a machine is learning. Like, how does it learn after a minute? This is what things look like when you uh, when it's trying to do pattern matching. After ten minutes, it looks like this. Finally, getting to the point where it's spitting out language and actual words and sentences and that. So it's just fascinating. So um, I'll leave it at that because otherwise, I'm just going to chatter on, and I really want to hear what Denise has to say. But That's I'll turn great. it off at the moment. 
Thank you, Jen. That's that's great. We're going to have to dive into this. Alta, welcome. Thank you. So Jen did a great job. <laughs> so let me just intersperse a few, few things. One thing I want to say is, is a nod and a, and a huge thank you to Don. The invite didn't become because Delaware Libraries was the, the place to go. Don, with his connections and all, invited several um, states to be able to go to the invite uh, libraries. And Jen and I, New Jersey and Delaware, are um, conveniently able to get there quicker than some and, and, and cheaper. So, so thank you, thank you, thank you for uh, the connections. Um, Jen and I were the very first ones there at the event. <laughs> so that was that was kind of fun. Um, I really encourage everyone to look at the attendee list. Be Jen and I were able to see the list before we um, went, and I was scared to death. Right? You look at it, it's like wow, because I know very little, and I uh, this is way over. Like uh, uh, Jen, uh, Jen said it perfectly. Like uh, like the, the the small child at the grown ups table, and we should have been at the other table. At, and um, when we got there, we were assigned tables. I was at table one. Jen was at table two. There was, um, I believe, originally there was nine tables. I think they got end up with eleven tables. And the reason why I'm going to this whole table thing is, it's like this is, is this is that our tables were were right at the front, so we were able to see the screens better, able to be really close to what was the action was, and a lot of the speakers for the the events were at our tables. So beyond that. Um, it was also um, notable in that at um, Jen said there was a lot of people from libraries, but mostly it was a pe Library of Congress groups and people associated. As far as public libraries, there's only the, the New Jersey, Delaware, and a person from Metropolitan New York for the digital AI. So when I, um, the breakout sessions, I want to just say that I felt this is one of the best conferences that I've been to is how it was run. So they had great speakers, they were engaging, good, a good discussion. And then the breakout sessions were long. I just, I just, it was actually a conference to a small mini conference today. And the breakout sessions are like 15 minutes and you have to go back in. These were 40, a solid 45 minutes to be able to talk at your table. Ta um, tables were at the very most 10 people at a table. And we never switched tables. We never switched for different breakout or had a choice. We've always stayed with that a group for the entire day which I thought made it much stronger and more, and we connected very well with that. And uh, even at lunch, we're sitting there talking to him, plenty of time to network with everyone else, but it wasn't as uh, necessary because you're so engaged with the group that you're at. The other thing I wanted to say about the tabling, I know I'm, I'm boring you to death with this, but um, right. when I when I started, um, the I was going to be nervous about how much I needed to know. So the first question they asked in our breakout was, who do you think this public AI should be for? What are the reasons for public AI? What do we need AI to begin with? And so I'm gonna, I thought I'd be a lurker and learner at the table. And the person to the left of me started off with saying, well, you know, I really think um, AI should help people that um, have uh, needs with the government. Say for instance, um, they they have forms to fill out for to get Medicaid or, or SSI or whatever like that. And they have to wait forever to get those results and they can't understand it. Well, people, my title is social innovator. My team with Delaware Libraries, Division of Libraries, is to work with social services and, and digital literacy and all that. So he, he was speaking my language. And as they were talking, I realized that really, they really are talking to the public. And who are we? We're the public, right? So it's not just the experts that have to be there. And I really felt um, included and a, a good part of the discussion. And that that is exciting because it's for all of us. So I think I think I'll leave it at that. But it was it was a, an excellent thing. We are we are sharing our emails and all that good stuff. I, I put in the link about the report that they put out about the the program. Please check out the attendee list. It's like wow, are you kidding? You know, White House is there. I mean, everyone. And also, I thought the executive order is interesting. They had an executive order that they had to do certain things um, quickly, and they accomplished them all um, before the, the due date. So I thought that was very impressive too on the yeah, panel. So thank you. Well, it's, it's, it's about time for libraries to be at the table. Yeah. Because, yeah. You know, because they should be the most comprehensive institutions we have touching so many public services. If you're trying to automate these services and, and you're not working with libraries, you're just missing a huge bet. Thank you so much. That that must have been exciting. And uh, 
Uh, the reports we got back were very favorable on on the participation of the libraries at the at the uh, session. And, uh, you know, you're helping put us on the map. I mean, it, it sounds like ridiculous, you know. Oh, yeah, libraries. Well, that's the typical thing. Oh, yeah, libraries. Oh, yeah, libraries. Well, yeah, libraries. So great. Terrific. Thank you so much for making the time, both of you, to go and, uh, and dip into this uh, melee of technology and society and the rest of it. So great. This is just going to start. So, Denise... Welcome, welcome. Hi, uh, thank you. Thank you for having me. Um, please introduce yourself, if you would, and, uh, you know, kind of how you how you came to this point, and then tell us what this point is. Sure. So um, my name is Denise Holt, and um, I, I have a company, AIX Global Media, and i um, I have been doing a lot of uh, writing and educating in the space of active inference AI and spatial web technologies. Um, these are new technologies and they're about to get into the hands of the public early next year. So uh, I've I've known it's coming. Um, you spoke about the IEEE working or the IEEE standard protocol. Uh, for the spatial web and the recent approval of that protocol as a global standard. I've been on the working group um, developing that standard for the last two years. This The working group has existed for four years. The development has been uh, occurring over the last four years. So it's finally gotten to the approval stage and it's um, it's become a global public standard now. And I'll talk more about that. Um, in my presentation, but um, but that's going to change everything. It's going to change everything about uh, the way we interact with technology, all emerging technologies, including AI. And Don, hats off to you for being here with COVID. I caught COVID mid July, and there's no way I could have been here. And so, you know, I really I wish you the best. I hope you recover very quickly. So uh, should I jump into the presentation or <laughs> should I jump into the presentation or is there something else? Okay. Um, let me go ahead and share my screen. All righty. And uh, can you see my screen? And uh, you have a play mode. I did push play. Um, I don't know why it came up like, do you see it like this to where it's like, uh, it's not showing correctly. Use slideshow maybe. Oh, there we go. Well, okay. Um, and let me get our faces out of the way <laughs> so I could see. Uh, okay, great. So, um, what I'm going to be discussing is active inference AI and spatial web technologies. And so the thing that we need to understand is that our internet is evolving. Um, and what this means is uh, right now we're in the World Wide Web where, you know, HTTP, HTML, uh, enable us to build websites on web domains. Before that, we had TCP IP, which enabled email, sending a message from one computer to another. And then HTTP and HTML made it to where we could attract people to our web domain. And, you know, we that is the, the state of our internet still. We've progressed to mobile to where now we can access and, and do all of these things through our own personal devices. Um, but it's still largely the same, and it's the World Wide Web. What's about to happen is uh, a new layer, a new protocol is uh, coming on top of our internet, and it's called the spatial web. Uh, the protocol is HSTP, Hyperspace Transaction Protocol, and the programming language is Hyperspace Modeling Language. And essentially what this is going to do is it's going to take us out of this library of pages 
and documents within the World Wide Web and, you know, the, the website domains that, you know, contain all of this data. And it's going to enable everything in every space to become a domain. And therefore, everything in every space and all spaces then become programmable through HSML. Um, and what this means is that you can program everything from permissions and credentials and, and ownership and all kinds of things, uh, you know, that pertain to the uh, entity itself, but also um, attributes, uh, descriptive uh, properties about those things and their interrelationships between each other. And uh, all of this is able to be um, tracked and updated in real time. So what this is going to enable is instead of just apps on our app store, uh, where you know you're you're interacting with an app, AI agents will become the new application software, and they'll be able to be built within the space. All of this uh, intelligence layer now within this spatial internet will become um, empowered through AI. And we'll talk a little bit more about that. There's a few entities that are behind this. Um, there's a company called Versus AI, and they actually uh, are the ones who developed this new protocol, but they donated it to the public uh, four years ago donated it to the IEEE so that these global core standards could be built around this. So that was their gift to the public, their gift to the world. The Spatial Web Foundation is a nonprofit that uh, has been organized around the development of this protocol, but this is a free public global protocol. And what Versus has done is they've built a platform that'll be the first uh, interface for the public to be able to play in this new, new space of the internet. And this enables an entirely new kind of AI uh, called active inference AI. It's a first principles AI. It's based off of uh, the same mechanics as um, biological intelligence. And uh, Dr. Carl Friston, he's the number one neuroscientist in the world. He's the most cited neuroscientist in the world. Um, and active inference is his methodology. Uh, it's based on a discovery of his called the free energy principle, which describes how all uh, biological systems learn. Um, and uh, maybe a year or so ago, uh, it was actually uh, proven by a research uh, team at the Riken Institute in Japan that indeed the free energy principle is how neurons learn. So um, it's entirely different than what we're seeing right now with current AI, which is uh, deep learning, machine learning AI. Um, it's a completely different approach. And we'll talk a little bit more about that uh, as we move through. So the future of AI with this technology is uh, shared, distributed, and multi-scale. It's an entirely new kind of artificial intelligence, and it's able to overcome the limitations of machine learning AI. Uh, this AI is knowable, explainable, and capable of human governance. It operates in a naturally efficient way. There's no big data requirement. Uh, any amount of data can be made, spot, made smart. And it's based on the same mechanics as biological intelligence. It learns in the same way as humans. And, the, uh, and like I said, the underlying principles have been proven to explain the way neurons learn in our brain. And if it sounds too good to be true, it's happening right now. So what is the spatial web? The spatial web is web 3.0, um, basically the next evolution of our internet, the same internet that connects us all that we're talking across right now. You know, uh, It's just another protocol layered on top of it that expands the, ne the network and expands the capabilities. So uh, the network itself is about to explode in size because of, instead of just web domains and websites, now every person, place, or thing in any space uh, can become a domain. Um, so 
it is the next evolution of the internet. It's going to be powered by AI. The new protocols are hyperspace transaction protocol and hyperspace modeling language is the programming language. Uh, it's a global socio-technical standards that have been developed over the last four years. And, um, and this slide was when it was in the final ballot process with IEEE, but it's actually been approved now. And four years ago, uh, interestingly enough, when uh, the IEEE began this process of the, the global standards around this, they deemed the spatial web protocol a public imperative, which is their highest designation. So what does this mean? Um, you know, it's basically our internet is about to become the internet of everything, exponentially expanding the number of domains in our network. Right now with the World Wide Web, you've got websites and they contain information, data, whether it's, you know, um, text or images or, you know, anything. And if you look at what these deep learning, uh, machine learning tools can do right now, they're doing things with that data, right? They're, it's natural language, it's image processing or video. What's different with this new technology is you're talking about spaces and all entities within spaces. And, you know, a spatial web domain then becomes a, an entity with a persistent identity through time with rights and credentials. And, you know, you're talking about dimensional concepts, organizations, agents, person, things. So everything is a part of this network and everything then becomes empowered by uh, AI. And it's an entirely new kind of AI. The current state of the art AIs are siloed applications. They're built for optimizing specific outcomes. Uh, they're unable to communicate their knowledge frictionlessly and collaborate with other AIs. If you notice, each AI application is a siloed application. Um, and it's trained to be able to produce those specific outcomes. What's different about this technology is it's it's a self-evolving system that will be learning moment to moment, upgrading its world model, its understanding of reality, and thus mimics biology while enabling general intelligence. So it's shared intelligence at the edge of everything, while these neural nets are just gigantic databases, uh, which require an immense amount of energy and power to run. So this decentralizes AI and it takes the processing to the edge, meaning instead of a gigantic database that has to process all of the training and all of the queries, now these agents can be dispersed across the internet and process at the edge, meaning at edge devices like your computer, your cell phone, um, you know, uh, private servers. Um, so you can think of it similar to the way as before personal computers, there were supercomputers. But once personal computers um, got in the hands of everybody, then all of the all of the processing takes place in their homes. Um, so it's a distribution of processing and power. Uh, Superpowered GPUs are not required. The processing takes place on local devices with existing infrastructure. Uh, it uses real live data, real time data from IoT sensors, machines, and ever changing context that's programmed into the network through HSML. And it eliminates the need to tether to a giant database. Active inference agents throughout the network learn and adapt from their own frame of reference within the network, and it minimizes complexity. Uh, it uses the right data in the moment for the task at hand. Now, HSML becomes a common language for everything, providing unprecedented levels of interoperability between all current emerging and legacy technologies. It's a programming language bridging communication between people, places, and things, and laying the foundation for a real-time world model of understanding for autonomous systems. 
HSTP, the protocol itself, the hyperspace transaction protocol, naturally uh, provides guardrails. Now, if you think of the World Wide Web that we're in right now, it's the most unsecured environment. It's why we have all of these problems like hacking, tracking, uh, faking. Um, and it, you know, it's really hard to secure. And in the same way, when you want to engage in a website here, you basically have two options. Yes, you can have access to all of my data and everything that I'm doing within your program or no, and then I'm opting out and I can't use it, right? So what H HSTP enables, because instead of transactions taking place under the umbrella of a centralized organization, now transactions take place at every touch point because everything is a domain. So you can be very nuanced in uh, programming permissions and required credentials and ownership and, you know, to the point where, you know, you can, uh, you know, be very selective of what parts of your data you'll allow for how long you can set uh, expiration dates on it. Um, it really does give us this data privacy and data sovereignty that we've we've wanted, but is impossible with the World Wide Web. Uh, it provides transparency and explainability. Active inference agents um, are explainable AI. Uh, you're, they, they can report on exactly how they're coming to their, um, their decisions and their outputs. That's impossible with deep learning neural nets. Um, this provides security and authentication, interoperability and standardization, user empowerment and control, and safety and reliability. And what we have then are programmable spaces. Anything inside of any space is uniquely identifiable and programmable within a digital twin of Earth, producing a model for data normalization. Uh, this enables adaptive intelligence automation, security through geo-encoded governance, multi-network interoperability, uh, and it enables all smart technologies to function together in a unified system. And from this, we get a knowledge graph, right? When, uh, when all spaces and objects and things become programmable and we can actually program context about the things and their interrelationships to each other, then what we're doing is we're building out this knowledge graph that becomes a digital twin of everything. Um, so essentially a digital twin of our planet and all nested systems and entities within it. This, uh, this creates an ecosystem of nested ecosystems. Intelligent agents, both human and synthetic, are involved. Um, sensing and perceiving continuously evolving environments, making sense of changes, updating their internal model of what they know to be true, and acting on the new information that they receive. And this provides accurate world models for these agents, for these intelligent agents. Collective intelligence trained on real-time data, uh, and it involves making decisions and updating its internal model based on what's happening now, not on historical data sets. So when these deep learning uh, machine models are trained, you know, you, they're they're loaded with trillions of data sets. Like the more information, the better they'll get at matching patterns and potentially giving you an, an outcome that seems appropriate for what your expectation is. These active inference agents are using real data, real sensory data coming in through IoT and cameras and different things and measuring it measuring it against a real contextual model that's ever changing of all of the interrelationships of the things in all the spaces and an understanding of reality in the moment in the world. So active inference is not a language model that's generating words about the world based on outdated knowledge it's been fed regarding the world. Active inference is like a biological organism that perceives and acts on our world by generating more accurate models, understandings, and beliefs about our world. HSML computes context, enabling AI's perception to understand real-time changing state of anything in the world. 
And I'll give you an example. So, you know, and, and a deep learning large language model can tell you a great story about New York City, but an active inference agent can tell you what's happening right now anywhere in New York City. Um, so it's completely different. Now, the free energy principle, which is what active inference is based on, and the free energy principle is the principle from Dr. Carl Friston that uh, describes how uh, neurons learn, how all biological systems learn. Um, these two things together, the, the, the knowledge graph of the world and the, the context, the computable context in all the things in all the spaces, and this free energy principle, uh, they, they um, give us a path to AI governance. It enables computable context that defines, records, and traces the changing details of physical and digital dimensions, social dimensions, meanings, culture, conditions, circumstances, and situations, whether geometrical, geopolitical, or geosocial by nature. And it's a system that safeguards and respects individual belief systems, sociocultural differences, and governing practices. And it minimizes complexity through natural intelligence. The more complex a system, the more energy it consumes. When you think of these gigantic databases that are, you know, layered neural nets that are processing these deep learning uh, inputs to give you an output, those require an insane amount of energy to do that processing. And for every query that comes in from you or, you know, anybody else, all of that has to run through the neural nets and run through an, an enormous amount of data in order to be able to give you an output. Um, it's extremely inefficient. And you know most people in the industry understand that it's really not a scalable option. Um, but if you look at how biological intelligence works, the human brain is remarkably energy efficient, operating on just 20 watts, less power than a light bulb. Um, so, this new type of AI, this active inference AI is sustainable AI because it mimics biology uh, and it's AI that thinks and learns while protecting the planet. And then it also enables human governance to scale alongside AI capabilities with unprecedented cooperation between humans and machine cognition. So Versus and the Spatial Web Foundation offer us the framework in which we can build an ethical and cooperative path forward for AI and human civilization. Because HSML um, <laughs> Versus was actually involved in a program uh, called Flying Forward 2020, where they it was a, a drone project that was organized by the European Union. And it, I think it involved like eight countries. But basically, it was proof of concept of taking, you know, what they learned from it is indeed through HSML, you can program human laws and guidelines uh, through a language that the AI can understand and abide by in real time. So um, this, this level of cooperation that we are going to be able to have will enable us to scale AI in tandem with human um, human guidelines, human cooperation. So this brings us to a technological awakening. The spatial web protocol creates somewhat of a nervous system for our planet. The approval of this protocol of the protocol standards by the IEEE represents a monumental leap forward in the evolution of computing and AI across the global internet. These technologies have the potential to create more intelligent, adaptive, and interconnected digital world, transforming numerous aspects of our lives and industries. So what we're going to see from 2025 to 2030 are smart cities, smart medicine, smart education, smart supply chains, and smart climate management. You know, with, with this digital twinning of the planet and these active inference AIs that can run simulations then based off of all of this real data. And the, the number of simulations is, uh, you know, unending. So, and they can run them simultaneously. So they'll be able to actually go, 
okay, we've run all these simulations. These are exactly the steps we need to take to correct uh, these problems, to uh, overcome these problems. You know, it's it's uh, the level of control we're going to have over correcting a lot of the emergency situations that we find ourselves in right now is going to be... Um, it's just going to be a saving grace, I think, for humanity. And then if you're familiar with uh, Buckminster Fuller's world game, network natural intelligent agents create a self-evolving intelligence that can help us manage our cities and supply chains, educate us in new ways, and help us realize Buckminster Fuller's world game. As Bucky said, make make the world work for a hundred percent of humanity in the shortest possible time through spontaneous cooperation without ecological offense or the disadvantage of anyone. And really that's what it's all about. So if you want a deeper dive into any of this, uh, visit my website, deniseholt.us. Uh, I host monthly learning labs. Uh, where you can learn about active inference AI and the spatial computing. I have um, courses that I'm building now, and in the next month or so, there will be curriculum available around this that, um, you know, uh, you can take entire e-learning courses, um, and I'll have certifications and things like that that I'm offering. But um, but yeah, the, uh, I think that's it. <laughs> so I'll stop sharing. Amazing. Just amazing. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, I mean, from what from what I get, that's all I can say about this. Um, okay, a couple I of questions. You. There we go. Hold on one second. Sorry. Uh, what what kind of response you get from the inventors of uh, TCP and HTML, uh, Vet and Tim? Oh, so it, what's really interesting is uh, back in January uh, at the World Economic Forum in Davos, uh, was it Dr. Carl Friston that was, I think Dr. Carl, because Dr. Carl Friston had a panel with Jan LeCun, who's the chief uh, scientist for Meta. And I believe he also was on a panel with uh, Tim Ber Sir Tim Berners-Lee. Um, so, yeah, I mean, they're, they're aware. I mean, obviously it, it, it's a natural progression. Right. You know, um, and when you look at all the emerging technologies that we have, right, uh, everything from distributed ledger technologies, which are like blockchain and digital currencies and all currency is moving into this digital currency space. And then you look at um, augmented reality and virtual reality. Um, you know, all a mixed reality. What this is going to enable is this mixed reality uh kind of experience that we've all imagined, but the framework wasn't there. HSML becomes a common language for all these emerging technologies to be able to become interoperable across the internet. So they're gonna come to life in ways that, uh, you know, we haven't seen because the, the ability has not been there. Um, and IoT, all of the IoT sensors now will be able to completely be integrated with each other and with this layer of intelligence across the network that's the mind-boggling part is the <laughs> amount of data that it, you're embracing uh is uh, you know it's, we're already at kind of peak data management and now you're opening your arms to m many times more uh so that's that's fascinating uh so th these build on top of these prior protocols or they kind of displace it yeah, no. So it's it built on top of it. And just like when we moved from TCP IP to the World Wide Web, we didn't lose TCP IP. We right. still send emails every day. It mm -hmm. All it did was just expand the capabilities within the network. And so that's what's going to happen here. We're still going to have websites. We're still going to have email. But what you've noticed is when we jumped to websites and then to mobile, you know, 80% of the time we're playing in the new space because of all the extended capabilities that it offers. So I think that's what we're gonna experience with this as well. Wow, uh, questions anybody? I've got one more for you. Reactions from big tech who are building these massive uh, models and investing yeah. heavily in it. Something well, tells me they're not totally fascinated with this or are they? 
So I, I, there's a few things happening there that are kind of interesting. And I actually wrote an article um, back in January and um, the interview is, or the panel is actually on, um, I think it might be on the Versus uh, YouTube channel if you wanted to check it out. But the panel between Jan LeCun and Dr. Carl Friston was really fascinating. You know, Jan LeCun is the chief scientist for Meta. And he's fully aware of Carl's work. In the, in the panel, he was like, I agree 100%. I, I think this is, you know, but he's like, but we don't know how to do it any other way than deep learning, right? He's thinking back pro propagation is the only way we know. And that's just not true. But I think the thing that he uh, wasn't really aware of in that conversation is, is that, so to back up for a second, um, active inference has long been thought to be an ideal methodology for AI. Active inference is not a secret to these big tech companies, but it's long been thought to be an ideal method, but it's also long been thought to be near impossible because it requires this context layer. It requires this grounding of understanding of reality for the AI. And that's what the spatial web protocol brings. That's what HSML brings. So I think a lot of these tech companies that uh, are so deep down the the um, the deep learning rabbit hole, you know, in the back of their mind, they just have this idea that, oh, that's a great idea, but it's really not possible. And all of this technology coming together with the spatial web protocol, the expansion of our internet into spatial domains, and the ability to distribute these uh, these agents within the network, that's that's the thing that, that makes it possible. So well, what wasn't possible could, before is now possible. I can appreciate <coughs> the appeal to certain engineers, uh, but I can also appreciate the challenge to certain business models by the people who manage the engineers. And so it's, what problems do you see in implementation? Um, you know, I I I don't really see problems because there's so many advantages so to this. Yeah, and I think that that there's <laughs> going to be a lot of advantages that that just guarantee the adoption and and people being excited about getting their hands on this technology. You know, one of them being that. Well, a couple of them. I mean, you know, it solves the energy problem <laughs> of deep learning and it uh, it decentralizes AI. Right. So um, so, you know, you don't have you don't have the um, you know, right now there's I think I saw a, a quote that like only like less than 10 percent of companies are using these AI products internally. And I think one of the biggest problems is they have to open themselves up to this third party with their proprietary data. And this enables an entirely different way where you don't do that. Your data is secure and you know you have guardrails and control over your data. So this is gonna open up AI to enterprise in a way that you can't with deep learning. And, um, and then it's, uh, you know, it's it's going it's it's just going to uh, enable corporations and anybody with a website presence right now, anybody with an app in the app store, they're just going to be able to offer by building intelligent agents as applications in this new space. It's going to offer so many more um, uh, capabilities for uh, their their customer base or their you know whatever they're building or offering the extended level of capabilities because these agents as applications are aware of each other and the network so mm -hmm. the 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 level of connections and insights that will be made in that space is going to be something we've never experienced before um, I I see it as we're about to experience an explosion of innovation like we've never seen, you know, and I think it's going to make uh, the World Wide Web and all of the innovation that that brought to us. I think it's going to pale in comparison to what we're about to see. That's a big that's a big claim. 
I know, I know. <laughs> and I, you know, I, I, I lived through all of that. You know, I, I'm, I'm no spring chicken. So, right. you know. <laughs> um, so the, the, uh, even though data is distributed and more manageable because it's out near the edge and you bring all these remote processors into play in this coordinated linked fashion, it's still a lot more data that's going to be digitized and representing a, a, a database. Uh, this is a question about maintaining data over time. It, maybe it's really not this topic, but I was just having an exchange with Vince Surf earlier. Vince going to come back on in a couple of months and talk about uh, decay of data, of digital content and how the iterations of, of technology, of hardware and software make all this immense amount of data that we do have now and is growing uh, unusable at some point and lost. And unlike the photos we have in a shoebox, you know, that lasts for 100 years. But this stuff, you would think it won't, but it, it, it's going to go away. I'm just curious how, how this yeah. could impact uh, data well, preservation. So we're going to have something that we don't have right now. Right now, the more data you have, how do we parse that data? How do we deal with it as humans? And we're going to have the assistance of these intelligent agents that will be able to parse the data for us and really help us to navigate through it all. And, you know, as far as, you know, the immense amount of data that's going to be created in all of this you also have technologies that are going to be able to handle it you know the um photonic chips different things like that you know that are going to basically use light speed uh <laughs> to to process right so all, all of these emerging technologies, they've been rising at the same time. So they're just going to be able to kind of come together and and make it all happen. Um uh you know, and, oh. and we, you know, in this new space of the internet, there's not just you as the user, there's you and AI, everybody is going to have an intelligent agent assistant, uh, mm -hmm. assistant that's going to know you intimately, uh, know all of your, I mean, for instance, think about just, you know, booking travel, it will be well aware of all of your travel documents, all of your preferences, everything else, it'll be able to act on your behalf and make all of the connections, because it's aware of and enabled through the internet, um, to actually make our lives easier in dealing with all of this data. So, who, so whose agent is that? It may be working for you in theory, but who... Who does it answer? It'll be to? yours. It'll be yours. Every person will be enabled within this new space to build these intelligent agents. And the 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 interesting part of it is if you're building an, an agent, you're imparting it with all of your specialized intelligence and your uh perception from your frame of reference in the network, right? And that's the beauty of all of these different agents from all over the world, you know, people from you know, Africa or India or China, you know, they can build agents that they're imparting with their understanding and their, uh, their knowledge and wisdom that will help them to be able to uh, deal with their, that will help them to be able to deal with their problems from their part of the world. Right. And then all of these agents are, are able to, um, to learn from each other and pass information and share beliefs with each other. So it's these, this agent layer is this intelligence layer of collective distributed intelligence. It's going to become kind of a, uh, an organism of intelligence. It's going to grow in knowledge in the same way human knowledge grows. You know, we grow our knowledge by, it, it depends on the diversity of knowledge within within the the sphere of human intelligence and we we test each other and push back on each other and learn from each other and that's how we grow our human knowledge these agents are going to do the same thing well all those neurons are mine personally and they're working for me in theory at least the ones that haven't been reprogrammed for me uh, <laughs> so, 
these will be some kind of hybrid because they, they'll be created by external uh, factors. Um, we're running out of time. There's a, a question about um, uh, device dependent. This is this. Uh, yeah, no. no it, cloud, it, cloud. It, these intelligent agents, they work on uh, devices we already have, laptops, cell phones. Um, mm. They're in, they're empowered off of any device. Now, more devices are going to come online. I mean, we've already seen Apple Vision Pro. You know, we've got the Meta Glasses. There's going to be all these new augmented reality devices that'll help us. You know, I just saw something yesterday, and it was glasses for the hearing impaired. That the glasses have a microphone or a microphone on them, so somebody can be talking, and it'll put the subtitles in front of their eyes, so they don't have to read lips anymore mm -hmm. like they don't you know it's they're, they're we're going to be so empowered by okay. all these new technologies that are able to uh take advantage of this okay two more questions um one uh, main ethical concern do you think what uh well i mean I think that we're going to see, I, I think we're more empowered through this technology to uh, really uh, approach human govern the, the governance aspect of AI. Um, Versus actually put out a report last year called the future of AI governance. And uh, in it, you know, they were talking about how, you know, HSML enables us to actually uh, take human laws and guidelines and make them programmable so the AI can understand and abide by it. So these active inference agents, they actually, because they're 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 learning in real time, they're self-reporting, they can uh, they can be governed by human entities. Um, they're going to lead to really trusted uh, autonomous systems that you know can handle mission critical operations. You can't do that with deep learning because deep learning, they're, you know, they're black boxes. You can't, you have no idea how they're coming to their outputs. They can go down a wrong direction very quickly. And it's really hard to uh, correct that. And they can give you, you know, an output that sounds like uh, it's credible, but it's absolutely wrong because if they don't have the information in their training data, then they'll mm -hmm. make it up as if it were true. So you just, there's no trust there. And this is going to be a more trusted system. So we'll have all levels of AI systems. These deep learning well, tools are not going to go away They're but they're going to be looked at as tools, you know, make me this, write me this, create me this, code me this. Um, and in versus a uh, report on a uh, potential governance for AI, they, they proposed an AIS rating system, an autonomous intelligent system rating system so that we can um, kind of know, you know, according to the level of capability of the autonomous system, what kind of governing capabilities we should give it, right? How much, uh, you know, how much control and how versus how much freedom. And I think it seems like a very uh, logical approach, and it's definitely doable with you know all of this new technology that's coming. Like a trust on. rating, almost. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Well, trust is what people are looking for. Absolutely. Yes. Uh, last question. <laughs> Excuse me. Um, what now? I triply just adopted this was last month or something. Yeah, so it. the the final vote was in, uh, yeah, it was like last month or so. Um, it went to balloting in April, and then it took a couple of months for, uh, you know, the final voting and everything to go through. And yeah, it's it's been uh, approved. That's amazing, because it's so hard to do stand oh, so hard to do standards, because it's always helping somebody and hurting somebody else, at least in their mind. Uh, so when, what do you see as kind of the next big event around this? What when will it kind of pop out or when will it kind of get yeah. people's attention or something? Well, so, you know, um, I know that uh, the Spatial Web Foundation is going to be publishing the standard over the next couple of months and making the, the standard draft document uh, publicly available. And I think it's like a 150 page document. It's uh, it's very comprehensive, yeah. but that will be made available to the public. 
Now, what Versus has done is they've built the first interface for the public to be able to interact in this space. So their their, um, operating system, for lack of a better word, uh, platform is called Genius. And with Genius, anybody is going to be able to build one of these intelligent agents as an application. So right now they're in beta uh, testing uh, with the wider developer community. And they've got huge beta partners like NASA, Volvo, Cortical Labs, you know, um, some some big players and a lot going on. They're working with smart cities all over the globe. Um, But the platform is going to be made available to the public early next year. So this is coming and we will all be able to start, you know, and as we start kind of building out, it'll be uh, a little rudimentary at first, but as this knowledge graph grows, the capabilities of these agents grow and, you know, you know, we saw the World Wide Web. <laughs> right, right, right. Okay, we're going to leave it right there. I want to thank you so much for this, and I want you to come back. You know, Absolutely. And, thank uh, you so much, Don, happened. and everybody else. I, I really appreciate the opportunity mm-hmm. to speak today. Jen, Alta, thank you so much for giving yes. us a report from last week. This is fascinating. So much technology is converging and so much interest, and there's a lot of changes that are happening. Uh, on a socio-technical level, as you use the term, which I thought was really interesting. So with that, we're going to stop the recording and we're going to thank everybody and ask you to come back on the next opportunity. And I would like to say too, if anybody would like more information, feel free to reach out to me. Uh, You can reach me on LinkedIn and, you know, I'm happy to engage. Okay, great. Everybody has your link on the registration page, including you. Okay. Thank you so much, Don. Hold on.